Okay. I've got you both. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. This is a really busy time of the year. Um, and, and so I, we're really grateful that you're able to, to um, uh, be part of this. Uh, this is a panel on um, human organs, whole human organs at high resolution. And we're joined here by Ali Erturk and Peter Lee. And the schedule that we're going to go for is, is I'm going to introduce Ali first, and then he's going to present and we'll take questions. So please put your questions in the chat for him. Uh, and then when he's finished, we'll uh, then join with Peter and he'll he'll present and we'll do the, the same thing with questions at the end. So um, thank you very much. And let me just introduce uh, Ali Ertuk is the director of the Institute for Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Regenerative Medicine at the Helmholtz Institute in Munich. His lab develops technologies to image large biological tissues at the cellular level, including whole mouse bodies and whole human organs. Cellular views on intact biological systems provide a holistic and unbiased approach to dissect out cellular and molecular me mechanisms governing the biological machinery. His general approach to science is to combine biomedical research with artificial intelligence and nanotechnology. Eriturk's team also uses engineering to develop tools to implement our technologies directly in the medical system. And I'll put a um, link to your lab, Ali, in the chat so people can take a look there. And then um, Thank you. I'll just sit back and, um, and enjoy your presentation and I'll, I'll let you take it away from here. Thanks very much, Todd. Great introduction. Well, you told actually the core of everything. I don't have to present much, I guess. <laughs> that was nice. Um, I'm also um, very happy to be here. And I would like to briefly present our recent technologies allowing us to do cell level mapping of large biological tissues, including whole mouse, but also human organs. Not only at the imaging level, but also now with the uh, proteomics at the molecular level. So, well, we are an organism of interconnected systems. From head to toe, we are wired with vessels, nerves, and other systems. Clearly, a disease affecting one part of the body will affect the rest. Cancer metastasis is a clear example of it. And we know that within organs, there is so much heterogeneous level of tissue. It is clear also to study organ function. It's important to, to look at the whole, whole organ, not the pieces of it. That's what we do in the lab usually, right? If you want to do even transcriptomics, we just take pieces of tissue from whole organ. Clearly, we are missing out a lot of the info, important information. And we want to overcome this. Of course, a, li a major limitation to do this, if you think imaging technologies, there isn't really a way to look at the cell level at large scale. If you if you use MRI, fMRI, DTI like imaging modalities, they're great to do. Of course, time lapse view of the systems, but doesn't provide cell level, molecular level information. And if you want to do cell, if you want to look at the cells and molecules, we can do histology. But this time we are looking at tiny piece of tissue. So our technology, so-called tissue cleaning, combines these two. We can look at whole organ like. Um, human kidney at cellular, even subcellular level. So what is tissue clearing? We are very familiar with histology sections staying look under the microscope, which is great uh, most of the time. But again, if you want to look at the big picture, we are missing out a lot. And to overcome this, we and others have been developing so-called optical tissue clearing technologies to convert opaque biological tissue into transparent structures. You can think this as converting milk into water. Now we can see through and scan through to obtain cell level details, as well as uh, networks of vessels and nerves in a whole organ systems. And when I started my lab, I wanted to carry these efforts from organs, which we initially developed mouse organs, the clearing first 3 d go after us, there was clarity method, many of you familiar but they were all only working on mouse organs. And I, uh, we decided to bring it to whole mouse as mouse being the mostly used uh, model organism. Then I wa uh, we wanted to study diseases at whole, whole organism level, not at just uh, organ level. We developed um, 3D score, um, uh, 
you discovered it in 2016 and we discovered it in um, 2019, which allowed us to make the whole mass bodies transparent like glass in the air. It looks uh, maybe like a toy, but it is like this, the whole mass rendered becomes like glass. And when you put it into solution, it disappears actually. And then now with the lasers coming from site, we can visualize the entire inner structure of the or, uh, organism. And as a neuroscientist, I was very interested in looking at the nervous system of a mouse, adult mouse. That's Taiwan EGFP reporter. You see end-to-end -end, uh, ner nervous system, excitatory nervous nerves of uh, this transgenic animal. And um, to show the utility of such uh, visualization, what does it mean? Uh, we did a local brain injury and look at the whole nervous system, not only the brain. That's what happens. People studying with the brain, they do something in the brain and they look at the brain. But we wanted to go beyond and looking at the whole body, we, we saw this nerves that are innervating shoulder blades after local brain injury, highly uh, denervated, de degenerated. So I think this is a very simple experiment but tells a lot why we should look at always the big picture because where we are focused as local may not be everything what's happening in, in the biology and most of the time it's not. And um, therefore we really do a lot of such as studies whenever we are concerned with animal models, we do whole body scale. And of course that means a lot of large data. We use deep learning to analyze uh, cell events, cancer metastasis, drug targeting, vascular uh, structures or cellular maps of human organs. So related to, of course, this meeting, now I will focus on the organ parts. We develop also a technology, not only to make the mouse uh, transparent, but also whole human organs. And that includes, for example, whole human kidney. We could render it fully transparent and then scan it with light like microscopy at cell level end to end, really generate the cell level information of this uh, organ with um, 200 billion cells. And you can look at now, you know, we are generating mathematical models of, for example, what does it mean to be a glutamyl on kidney? How many capillaries you need around all these interactions of cells? And one of our aim is to use this as in the regenerative um, purposes for 3D printing. This will pro be for us blueprints of the organs that we want to generate small scale than large scale. So, of course, um, this mapping um, at the moment works in human organs. We have to use some dyes, and um, unfortunately, we cannot stain the whole human organs antibodies. We, and also, of course, we cannot make the organs tr uh, transparent, uh, sorry, transgenic, that they express EGFP. But pig organs, they can express EGFP. We are also working with pig organs. We can, for example, create EGFP pig organs. A cool thing about, of course, pig organs similar to human organ size, and they, for example, if you think brain with the old generation, imitates the human brain much more than a mouse brain. And then we have chances to do high resolution imaging, for example, here, EGFP expressing uh, beta islets in, uh, in, in mouse pig. We can visualize all the details at you know cell level. You see now the global view. We dive in, you can see this. Um, individual uh, islets in green and the, uh, all the capillaries around. And you can really see individual cells in these islets. And uh, using the algorithms, we can uh, faithfully quantify all these things. And when we do this kind of imaging, the big view, it provides us also a lot of new information. Sometimes we come up with anatomical information that wasn't really clear or unknown because now we are able to look at a cell level, the whole thing. And for example, if you, when we were doing this uh, imaging in the mouse heads, we identified that there was small uh, connections, channels between skull marrow and meningeal surface of the brain. And this is like about 100 micrometers gate. So imagine there's this hundreds, uh, thousands of immune cells just next door of the brain surface. And we know that neuroinflammation is involved on almost all pathologies. And we suddenly discovering these connections. Now we suddenly open a new gateway uh, or thinking how to deal with brain inflammation, because maybe not only this some limited number of microglia in the brain important, but also these hundreds of thousands, millions of cells just next door, they're important and relevant. 
And uh, we now we are very much focused on understanding this um, uh, channels um, connecting skull marrow to brain, not only in uh, in mouse but also in human. So we uh, we confirm this presence of this channel, for example, channels in postmortem human uh, skull samples with meninges. You can see a skull marrow connected to dura, and you see this IBA one labeled macrophages also. Uh, suggesting that there is this connections and immune cell trafficking between skull marrow and meningeal surface of the brain. And one question for us unclear. So when we are focusing on skull and um, trying to see whether it has any relevant function to the brain, and one can think if skull is any different than other bones, right? Skull bone marrow is a bone marrow. When immunologists, they talk about bone marrow, they call it bone marrow. They don't say skull bone marrow or femur bone marrow. It's just as if it's just the same. You can imagine actually it's not. So we did uh, transcriptomics and proteomic studies to compare the bones, different bones. You can see here proteomics, very split. Skull is very different. Actually, if you could look at this 8, 10,000 protein and, and PCA plots, skull is really being um, you know, grouped by itself. It means there is something happening here in terms of brain-related function. And um, we from here, we directly actually also move into checking into the patients um, with, for example, Alzheimer's uh, in TSPO PET. TSPO PET shows there's inflammation um, um, of uh, immune cells in the brain. And this is used now to check the uh, dementia patients, stroke patients. And you can see, actually, if you look at now, the Alzheimer's brain, we see these spots of increased infl inflammation, but also you can see this inflammation in skull marrow. So very interesting. So you can see maybe in 3D better here, the inflammation in the skull marrow uh, actually mirrors the inflammation in the brain. So that's, I guess, also because of these connections. It's just there's quick uh, immune cells movement uh, back and forward. And you can also see the inflammation in the brain is a, a skull is a, even stronger. And when we go actually initial times of disease development, skull inflammation seems to be coming earlier than brain inflammation, which can be a di diagnostic tool that we are now um, further investigating, not only in dementia, but also stroke, uh, two types of MS for RT motor disorder. You can see again, every time there's inflammation in the brain, there's inflammation of surrounding skull regions. And these are relevant uh, quantifications. So overall, a whole um, looking at the biology, at big picture, whole organ, whole organism level at, at cell resolution provides us a lot of new information, including new anatomical uh, uh, insights. But of course, study of biological tissues is not only imaging, but also molecular profiling. And of course, since in the case we are using labeling RNA proteins and doing a DNA um, check. So these are all targeted though, right? We have an antibody to stain and a RNA molecule to hybridize. But uh, with the uh, advent of uh, transcriptomics and proteomics methods, now we are not looking one by one, but all tens of thousands of these molecules, great. So we suddenly move at the molecular profiling size, especially with single cell transcriptomics, a new era of investigating biological tissue. We are much more unbiased and we let the biology to speak. But unfortunately, this is not the same with imaging. When we start combining imaging with molecular profiling, what we did in terms of spatial proteomics, a slice and the molecular profiling of it. And we call it spatial, but it's not spatial, right? it's 2D. So then this 2D section um, that of course is then becomes biased because from whole brain tissue, one has to section and choose something, right? If you, it's if usually one in 1000, this section, and which one to profile? Well, that's a bit of a luck here, or what do you want to claim? But ideally, we should be looking at everything. So to overcome this, we call up, develop so-called DISC-OMS technology. Now we can make whole organs transparent and scan them and then identify pathologies. For example, here, A beta plaques. You can look at, for example, here in the mouse model, we are uh, looking into whole brain of the 5XFAD mouse model, a D mouse model very early ages, six weeks, where there was no, there's no plaques reported in the literature um, because people sectioned and looked, they didn't see, but we make the whole brain transparent. 
and scan it with lightshade microscopy at cell level and use AI-based algorithms. Now we can identify these few initial plaques wherever they are. You can see now maybe they are coming in red, but then also choose some of them like here in yellow, isolate them and run proteomics. And we know in 3D where they come from. And then we have now attached proteomics information to this. And you can imagine this could be any pathology that could be cancer metastasis, that could be some inflammatory region of um, you know, microvessel infarct, et cetera, in the heart or in the brain. So when we um, did start doing this uh, from clearing transparency to proteomics, something we were very much surprised that the proteome is fully preserved. You can see here three different disco clearing. The outcome is uh, as high as in the proteomics, mass spec proteomics as high as fresh tissue and not only in mouse, but also long-term preserved, several years preserved human tissue. We made it, we cleared, then did the proteomics, the same consistently similar level. And what we also see is that um, there is not really shift in protein group. The only thing is shifting here, for example, in uh, disco clearing versus fresh tissue, the blood uh, molecules, and that's expected because fresh tissue is not perfused. Therefore, we have blood molecules. It's a kind of positive control but otherwise there is no shift of the protein groups. And for me, it was also interesting to see the membrane proteins, which I always thought when we do this clearing, we do this lipid removal and membrane permeabilization. We would, I would expect there would be some decrease there, but also it looks like the proteins in the membranes are fully preserved, which is of course very important for track discovery and targeting. So overall, uh, the... Uh, combined with AI algorithm, the cell level imaging can give us uh, a lot of um, information, more or less unbiased imaging. Of course, here with the plaques, we can do them at uh, LM brain atlas registration and identify these plaques region by region. So um, pathologies are, uh, again, could be anything. And then we can isolate them from clear 3D image tissue and run the mass spec. And something we had to develop actually to be able to do this at scale, uh, how to isolate. You have this cleared organ and how do you isolate these tiny regions? So if you section, now you start sectioning, you know, if you want to do section and laser dissection, this is not the best way which we started, but we quickly come to the conclusion that's not the way to do it. But to overcome this, actually, we develop this engineering solution, robotic solution. So there is uh, transparent tissues being scanned under the microscope. And then the robot communicates with the system and the imaging center, whenever we see the one plaque, you know, or a cancer, a pathology, something, any region of interest that could be also healthy tissue that we want to profile. We can take those regions out and then bring it to mass spec proteomics. And I'm very excited about this technology. Of course, this is not single cell uh, technology, but proteomics at the moment, unfortunately, is not single cell. But the cool thing about proteomics, of, of course, it tell, it's a relatively real deal because the proteome, proteome that makes the function, right? If you want to develop drug, understand the biology, proteome is, proteome is mostly more relevant than transcriptomics. And with using the convolution methods the, from these regions that we extracted, we can almost come to the individual cell level. So it's not single cell, but it's coming close. So we had to overcome a lot of problems here, engineering things not to bore you. We had to develop some sample holders that when the biopsy needle insert is inserted, it doesn't move because it's imaging. And then uh, algorithms that will communicate with the microscope, but at the end we got it up and working. And you can see, for example, here from even bone marrow, this green part, we can insert this uh, tissue and needle, biopsy needle and extract the tissue. And in human organ mapping, we have been also very much focused on heart to understand. And here, a human heart that someone died from um, cardiac arrest. You can see, for example, we made it, cleared it, and then look at through the aorta. You can see these aortic plaques shown in green and, and yellow gold. And this, there are, you know, we are diving through in whole human aorta. You see there are tiny plaques, there are big plaques and their regions without plaques, a lot of them. And then our idea was to use the robot, extract these uh, regions that are small plaque, no plaque, and big plaque, to try to get this evolution from no plaque to small plaque to big plaque, what ha what's happening in the tissue. 
and we uh, we yeah analyze this using proteomics and identify proteins that are relevant, known for uh, uh, carotid artery disease, but also quite a few new ones that we would like to follow. So overall, uh, this whole transparency gives us cell level imaging. And again, this could be healthy tissue. This could be disease tissue, whole human organs, like as I show you, human heart. And after that, uh, we could choose region of interest and then run the proteomics and put ideally what we want to do, I want to do, we did also this consortium and efforts have these maps that where we have the cell level information, but molecular information with proteomics uh, attached to these regions. And hopefully it could, these maps could also serve an atlas for transcriptomics information where people doing transcriptomics, analyzing different parts of heart tissue, they could put it there. And then we have an interactive way of both anatomical and molecular look. With that, I would like to thank and funding agencies, AI team, robotic team, and there's the full team. And I'm happy to uh, take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali. And uh, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat. And uh, we have a question here, Ali. Um, you, you started off by talking about the importance of the interconnectedness of these systems and seeing things as part of a, <clears throat> of a network or a living system with interactions. Do you feel like that is becoming more the consensus in, in uh, research now of, of seeing the, the importance of those? Or do you feel like that's still something that's lagging um, behind? Uh, clearly, we have to go in this direction. We have to see that systems is in track. Now, we are trying to map individual organs, let's say in human organ mapping efforts, but probably we have to already move into thinking interconnected systems. Of course, it's very difficult to do at this scale. You know, there are imaging model modalities you can do large scale, but the resolution is that maybe it's, it would be combined, right? You have a bit low resolution, bigger picture. Let's say you scan the chest area, you see the organs and the lymph nodes and the blood vessels, the connectivity is there. And then you can do some selected organs and tissue regions, high resolution and get molecular information. I think at the end, the ideal thing would be whole human body scanned at cell level and profiled at cell level. So that's the ideal, ideal case we will have, I guess, in some hundreds of years. But, you know, we will we, we are going in that direction. Clearly, we can do this at animal models, and which is, of course, important for us already when we want to develop drugs, treatments, we have to, again, look at the whole system. And in mouse models, luckily already, this is available. Thank you. Ali if, Ali, if I can ask a question. Yeah, uh, sure, please. I really, like, I really like the combined uh, robotic guided biopsy needle um, to go through and probe the proteomics while you're doing the sheet light. I can see that working quite easily uh, when for fully dense. Have you used it for things such as the lung or for the heart, where you'll get local distortion and collapsing as the needle goes into regions which are full of air or fluid? Um, good point. So um, it is not ex non non destructive, right? Imagine um, with the needle when you go in, you make a hole already. If you want to isolate a tissue a bit deep, um, you have to kind of. So we have the stylet needles. The hole is closed. The needle goes in but it doesn't extract anything until it goes. When it's at the target, the stylet goes out and then we can take the final region. So that's how we make sure what we want to get, we get only what we get. And imaging also guides us. We always, we are imaging while we are doing this extraction, we know where we are. But of course, then there's some tissue distraction with the needle, um, at least the path. So there we have to, of course, um, probably start profiling from surface to dip, for example, if they're in the same tra trajectory. But I think considering the big big size of organ, this small tissue that we lose is, is not much uh, actually compared to the rest. And uh, with the clearing, if you're asking if clearing, uh, or to, for me to add this, if clearing cause anything, distraction in the anatomy and so on, so there is the shrinkage of the tissue with our clearing, especially, but it's quite isotrophic. So it's, it's really like uh, like a balloon, air goes out of, so you can scale it back easily. 
I think what I say, suggesting now is that when you come into a tubule, so if you, as you're showing, you're going through to a plaque right beside either a vessel or by an airway, that as you put the needle in, it actually compresses the surface and will, will cause distortion as you're putting the needle in. I was wondering whether you'd seen that or what, I mean, because I'm very interested in using the same technique. Mm -hmm. um, putting the needle in the surface through the vessels, but, you mean, for example? Yes, yeah, so if you have something like lung, so if yeah. you're putting in a whole lung, and you ha have airways all the way through in the tissue, as the needle goes through a membrane into the surface, it will actually distort the membrane as it's coming through. Mm -hmm. This so happens in real biopsies. Is, exactly, this happens in real biopsies. One thing here, the organ is cleared. After clearing, it's a little bit like becomes a bit silicone. It's a bit tough tissue. It's not any more fresh tissue. There is not this uh, elasticity. So the, the tissue is hard. It's fixed, PFA fixed, clear. That means there is no water. There is no flexibility. We had to spend, you know, almost 10 months to figure out actually how we will make this normal biopsy that works for fresh tissue, that it works for this hard tissue. Therefore, we took quite a long for this revision. We underestimated the work, but now we have it that um, mechanically we can do it. But again, it's because it's cleared uh, tissue, it's uh, tough. It's not like uh, fresh tissue. There's not this uh, bending of the tissue with the insertion. Thanks. Sure. There's another question here, Ali, um, and this is, I guess, kind of an administrative question in a sense. For your lab, how do you decide um, what avenues to pursue or where to go in uh, in terms of your interests and directions um, and when to involve the robotics team and when to, how does that, how does that kind of work in just the, the functioning of the, of the lab? <sighs> Yeah, a lot of learning. So we are now quite a, a diverse team in that regard. You know, we are computer scientists and engineers working together. So for us, it has been clear that almost every project we want to do needs to involve all these domains. So we want to do the clearing imaging, the chemistry. We, know the new, we need to do biology, but also we have AI team always analyzing this large tissue. And we, we, should, we have now recently always also proteomics team involved that we, we don't want to just being you know, stuck at nice images. Cool. So what? Now we can go into an isolated regions and get into a biology, right? So th that seems that we will, for us, it will be default that we are going to be using all these domains uh, together to address what we want to address. Thank you. And we just have another uh, question here from Kadi, who's joined us. Good morning, Kadi. Um, and she asks, can your technologies help extract uh, the 3D lymph vasculature? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, with the biopsy needle, we can only do a tiny piece of tissue so that it doesn't, you know, isolate the whole. Um, I don't know if actually what would be the use of case of it. So if you want to do, for example, imagine it's something what we we are thinking to do, 3D imaging mapping. After that, sometimes, you know, like this, where there are vessels, you could section and in a slice, you have it. And then you can do molecular, molecular special, regular spatial transcriptomics on it. So what is the difference than normal transcriptomics, spatial transcriptomics? This time you have whole 3D information. So this slice of molecular information can go back onto this. And then you have this, let's say, a lymph vessel all going and then it runs through your section too, but it goes. So you know where it comes from, where it's connected to do, but you, have, you happen to have also this slice information with the molecules. So that's something we can do. So overall, clearly at the imaging site, we can map cells, uh, lymph vessels, blood vessels at cell level, no problem. If you want to combine it with proteomics, that can that can happen only on the tiny region or a slice uh, part. Great. Well, Ali, I know that your your schedule is tight, and uh, so I'll let you let you go on. And uh, th but thank you for making taking some time out of your day for, uh, for joining us. And this has been really so, great. Yeah, great. So I'm uh, sorry also I couldn't uh, you know participate the whole thing. It would be great to also discuss with Peter together combining. 
uh, larger scale images with higher resolution, definitely there is this is a good way to go having this whole view then getting into uh, higher, even higher resolution uh, information with light shade microscopy. But I guess we will do this another time brainstorming later. Actually, I'd love to talk to you because uh, some of the methods you've used on optical clearing for speeding up the clearing and also the functional staining really should be transmitted to other things. And you've done a beautiful combination of adding those. Yeah, great. All right. All right. So take, take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. All right. Um, I'm going to now introduce Peter, and I wanted to just uh, share with you the, the slide he sent so you can see this wonderful image here. Um, so hopefully you can see that. Uh, so let me introduce uh, Peter Lee from the University College London. Uh, Peter is Professor of Materials and Royal Academy of Engineering Chair in Emerging Technology in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at University College London. His research focuses on developing synchrotron X-ray imaging techniques and computational models of three-phase structures at the micron scale. He co-developed hierarchical phase contrast tomography with Paul Tafro at ESRF to image of intact human organs with a resolution 150 thousandth of the field of view or a micron in a 15 centimeter organ. And I'll put this uh, this web here uh, address in the chat so you can check out more of that. And then with that, Peter, I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you so much for presenting today. Great, thank you very much for the introduction, Todd. And thank you for the whole um, organizing group for inviting me. I, hopefully I'll be able to go through and show over the next 20 minutes or so um, some of the technology that we've developed. And really I wanted to start off with what it can actually do. And it nicely complements what Ali just showed. So uh, Ali can go through and optically clear large organs. Um, we can go through and use x-rays with phase contrast to again, similarly go from whole organ all the way down to cellular level for some cells, not for all. And so really why use um, hip CT? Well, hopefully this will show you, which is on the left is is an MRI with a resolution of voxel size of about 350 microns. On the right is hip CT on a newly developed beam line where we can go through and we can get resolutions down to seven microns currently in an entire human brain. This one's using a scouting resolution of about 20 microns. We can first go through, and these are ex vivo human brains, so about 15 centimeters in diameter. We can first go through to a scouting, and then we can zoom into any regions down to, first of all, six microns. And so without a biopsy, so we don't need a biopsy, we can simply use a local tomography technique to zoom right in and show the whole vasculature. And we can zoom right down to two microns in this case. And so that enables us to see the microvasculature across the whole brain and zoom down to cells in individual locations. So if we go through then and I'm sorry, uh, go. It's not just on the brain, but we've been able to do all the major organs. Um, it wasn't inside of a, of a body as shown here. That's simply uh, visualization. Um, the, each of these organs was extracted and then independently scanned with a scouting overall resolution of about 20 microns, locally zooming into areas of interest down to as close as one micron. We are, however, hoping to go through, and I'll show you um, shortly, we're hoping to install in over the next three months a rotation stage that will enable us to put an entire cadaver and scan an entire cadaver at a resolution of 25 microns. Zooming locally, we think we'll be able to achieve about two microns, so just down to the cellular level for some cells. So I really wanted to just come back and say, how did HIP-CT begin? Well, it actually was one of the things, and hopefully a good thing that came out of COVID, unlike many of the bad. Um, back in January of 2020, 30 months ago, uh, it was going through and 
we were shut down. You can see uh, here a radiograph of the lung where, let me just quickly, quickly see if I can do a laser pointer, radio, radio, uh, CT of the lung. And you can see that there's areas which are suddenly have fibrosis or liquid filled. And unfortunately, it caused closure of both UCL and also of the European synchrotron, which is shown in the lower right-hand corner. I'd worked for about 15, 20 years ago on imaging of vascular systems, all the way from the imaging of vascular systems in mouse eyeballs up to large, larger components, with a fellow who, Max Ackerman, on the right-hand side was the mentor of Max and Ackerman. Max called me in March and said, Peter, can you help us actually quantify and resolve the damage that COVID's doing in lungs? So far, this has been done in small lungs with radiography using phase contrast. I called Paul Taffro, who I know had been working on a technique which he was developing for looking at paleontological uh, applications. So to look at fossils, in fact, he's a specialist in the development of uh, the teeth of dinosaurs. So he was doing it on quite large fossil objects and was just in the midst of building a new beamline. At the same time, the European Thinkatron had just finished its upgrade to a fourth generation source. And that meant that it had a much higher coherence, much finer sport, spot size, and higher energy, all of which I'll show you we utilized in order to go through and develop our new technique. And we also brought on board a number of other people, including Claire Walsh, who is an expert on image analysis. And today, we're now collaborating with over 50 groups worldwide. So let's go from where I'm based, which is London, England, at University College London, and fly over to the European Synchrotron which is based in the Southern French Alps. We can go through and look at it and see that it's on a site between two rivers. And the synchrotron itself does something which is takes electrons, emits them out of a source and puts them in a LINAC or a linear accelerator, accelerates them up to nearly the speed of light. They're going so fast that they're actually aging 80% slower than us. They only want to do one thing. They go into a booster ring, and that's go straight. We bend them, and so they go actually not in a circle, but a series of circular of, of linear segments. We bend them, and then bending them, they release electromagnetic radiation. Radiation is something which is from near infrared to hard X-rays. Using this upgrade, it let us actually go through and see things that are within whole organs coming down to one micron or a fiftieth of a human hair. And that's an image of Paul Tafro um, going through and doing some of the early experiments with equipment that was built in Oxford, um, designed in, in London, shipped to SRF, working together with medics from Germany and other countries. Caddy, when she went through, and I see she's on right now, suggested that it would be quite nice to see a walk around at some of the labs. So I got one of the uh, research fellows who's a UCL research fellow, but based permanently at ESRF, to do a walkthrough to show you what it's actually like. So I'll hand over to Joseph. He did this two days ago because I think he's off skiing this weekend. You can see his bicycle, which he dropped off in order to cycle in to do the, do the video for us in the evening. In fact, we had five uh, ministers from Germany and France visit, so it was done up for them, converted a, an entrance way for dropping off, putting in vans, put in equipment. So that's where they're going to put a new stage that will take a 300 kilogram cadaver and the required equipment.
And because of the dust, all the detectors have been moved to the end of the hatch where they're actually on air bearings to float. And thank you very much, Joseph, for that. So with a little bit of a view of what a synchrotron looks like, what the actual fundamentals underneath, which is really accelerating electrons up to the, nearly the speed of light, bending them, releasing what is effectively an X-ray laser. So a highly coherent beam that lets you use phase contrast. I'd like to then just quickly, before we go to some of the technique and theory, show how it might be useful and an example looking at whole organs. I think Allery already showed some nice examples of this, how by connecting what's happening locally, we can scale up to the whole organ. In fact, one of the um, first impacts from this using of the technique on the whole organ was the medics that I worked with had a hypothesis that COVID-19 actually causes angiogenesis and causes shunting between the two vascular systems in the lung. Of course, on a small histology slice, or even on a larger biopsy, you can't tell which vascular system the local microvasculature is connected to. But with hip CT, you can. You can start with the whole lung lobe, take the vascular, connect it up to the initial vascular systems, and scan all the way down into the secondary pulmonary, pulmonary lobules, all the way down to the alveoli, all the way down to which microvasculature you're going through and the changes in that, the angiogenesis or growth of new microvessels. So that was one of the immediate applications. Another one was really going through and trying to understand when you have local disconnections in what is a clinical CT, so it's a clinical CT on a person. Um, going through, you can see the different areas of opacity. What is that opacity actually equal to? So what we did is go through and connect that on the same lungs to scanning at that scale. And what we want to do is really use AI to connect between. And so this is skipping to an ex vivo of a lung, a lung, a, sing a single lobe of a lung. You scanned with hip CT, scanned first at this 25 micron scouting resolution. You can see that the overall detail is massively greater than what you'll get with clinical CT, where the resolution instead of 25 microns is on the order of one micron. We're now zooming to six micron resolution without biopsying. So we have a perfect registration, which means if we have a human overall reference atlas, we can go and use things like the vessels to map all the way down to the scale of six micron. We've now just flipped to two micron resolution and you can see all of the walls. And in fact, you can see individual blood cells within the, the walls of the alveoli. And so we can go and jump across these scales. What does that let us do? Well, if we have something like this lung, which first of all, we had clinically scored in terms of the patterns of damage. And so we could then go through and look at clinical scoring of the damage and then zoom. We could then relate from 
subsections without having to biopsy exactly how in what's a control or a healthy lung, the overall ratio of surface area inside of a specific volume of lung, what the ratio of surface area to volume is in a control, then look at a partially damaged area, and then look at an area which is so damaged, there's almost no oxygen exchange happening in that segment of the lung. And what you can see immediately is that it really becomes diseased almost per subalveol and that the COVID has spread and caused fibrosis and liquid infill inside a whole subglobule. And what that lets us do is then go back and hopefully correlate that to the clinical image. Something we're doing, trying to do, but haven't actually done yet. And so what we're hoping to do is correlate what we see in HIPCT, but because HIPCT, to get that high resolution, we need a high flux of X-rays a flux that would actually be deadly, unfortunately, if it was to a live person. So it's all done on people who've donated, that died, donated the body to science, and we've um, taken the organ and extracted and examined it ex vivo. What we, we could do is directly correlate that to a series of voxels inside of the CT, get a subtexture where we can cross correlate the subtexture here to what we're seeing in the actual hip CT using machine learning, as Ali was suggesting and several people previously to do this cross correlation. And so this is one of the key things that the group's working on now. Well, hopefully having grabbed you on a potential way of using hip CT, both to get new insights into disease such as Max and Danny did in angiogenesis through to hopefully mapping up to clinical work how does HIPCT actually function? What it does is we first of all do what we call a scouting scan. The beam size is 18 millimeters high by 300 millimeters wide, which means as we rotate an object, we can go through and get up to a whole five, half meter human inside a single beam in a single scan. We then have to raster like CT up and down and like MRI. But then what we can do is go to a local zoom. Because we have a perfect background to, to subtract, we can zoom as it, into, as I just showed, and I'll play again, a kidney. Uh, oh, no, try and play again. I've just lost my mouse. Um, <laughs> a kidney to go through and show, show what's happening in terms of that. We then use something called phase contrast. So. In a normal radiograph, you can really just see variation due to attenuation. Attenuation um, contrast is due to the electron density. In soft tissue, there's very little variation density, really 5 10% maximum, unlike the density going to hard tissue, which is why in the initial radiographs um, done, you could see the, the bone inside of the overall soft tissue but no characteristics of soft tissue. By using phase contrast, instead what you're doing is because the x-rays are now all coherent or in phase, we can actually come through and they'll shift at an interface. There'll be a little bit of refraction or due to small variation in density, you get a difference in speed of light and that causes a shift. They then on the plane of interface, either constructively or constructively or destructively interfere. And so you get this propagation through to where you have a, a much greater contrast, in fact, almost a thousand times greater contrast at the interfaces in soft tissue. And so we use something called propagation phase-based imaging. And that was particularly enhanced by having the extremely bright, brilliant upgrade of ESRF. And what happens, as shown here schematically, is at the interface, as you go further and further away, the wave fronts interfere more and more, and you get more and more highlighting of your interface. And in particular, the ESRF, because it reduced the spot size from so something that was on the order of four nanometer divergence to 100 picometer, one fortieth of that, and a much smaller spot size to begin with, it allows you to get a much greater propagation distance and hence a greater phase contrast, which really has enabled all of this. We also went through and developed a number of other improvements. Developments were going from simple phase retrieval to also adding attenuation protocol 
and using the full dynamic range optimization to get this tremendous improvement in overall a final image. And then we added in the hierarchical where we can zoom by doing a perfect background subtraction by having a background generated that's identical to that of the object. And what that's let us do is very much as what Ali has done with optical clearing, is span from really histology. And you can see on the right-hand side, in pink, a histological section, in grayscale below it, a hip CT, where there's almost no difference between the histology and the um, hip CT, except of course that the hip CT is fully 3D. In the center, you can see an entire lung vasculature um, zooms locally all the way down to the microstructure, which is the information that our colleagues used to go through and help support their hypothesis that uh, COVID-19 causes angiogenesis and the shunting between the two vascular systems. So again, like optical um, clearing and quite complementary, our technique takes about 24 hours to scan an organ down to seven microns, about an hour to scan to 20 microns, but it's much faster to prepare the organ than optical clearing, which could take up to four months. However, we don't have the ability to do the same functional overall staining yet, I should say. We did a lot of other things as well in terms of um, preparing. Obviously, with COVID victims, there's a lot of work on the autopsy, the fixation, the dehydration, and then stabilizing. We use an agar to completely stabilize the organ so that it holds in the same location so that we can do MRI, clinical CT, and hip CT, all with the same overall uh, core correlation and do a direct correlation between them in order to do a reference atlas. We also did a lot of work on both the data reconstruction and um, the reconstruction techniques and analysis and sharing. And we did, if people are interested, as listed in a paper that we published in Nature Methods a year ago, detail a number of other developments, both in technique, preparation and analysis. What we're currently working on now is actually scaling this upscale to try and correlate it to MRI, the slices you're going through. We see here a diffusion MRI image. We're trying to get um, mapping and use actually a structure tensor analysis of the hip CT to correlate that to diffusion. And similarly, not just going upscale to clinical, we're trying to go downscale to spatial transfer filmics. Where we're able to go and take very much as Ali showed local biopsies and then do high resolution and go through to spatial transcriptomics in order to try and register it. Again, work in progress. And finally, really to look at this creation of a human organ atlas, we've now scanned over 50 organs. We're trying to put together a hub to scan many more, to open it up for open access for groups worldwide and provide funding for your helping to train them. You can find all of the data, um, actually much of the data, not all of the data, it takes a huge amount of time to upload at human-organ-atlas.esrf.eu. We're also loading it up onto the cloud and using NeuroGlancer, very kindly um, provided by Google, so that these huge data sets could be interacted by people around the world. And with that, I'd really like to just leave a few minutes for questions and discussion. And again, thank the many, many people who both funded this and all the students, postdocs, and collaborators who made this work possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we've got a number of questions here in the chat. Um, I, I just had a quick question, though, about um, it seems like at a key moment in this, um, <clears throat> there was a collaboration between you and uh, Paul Tafro, who, who does the, the fossils. Um, how, how did that come about? How did that, were, were you aware of each other's work? Are you friends or how, did, how does that sort of uh, type of uh, uh, happen? Absolutely, great, great question. So um, these two medics in Germany, Max and Danny, phoned me up in the midst of the lockdown and asked the question. I called, so fortunately I knew both the science director at Diamond, who I called first, which is the UK light source, they were actually able to help us with biopsies. So we started with biopsies to quantify it. 
but really we got this idea. I'd heard of the beam line that Paul was going through. So I called the science director at uh, ESRF, who went and round and enthused Paul. Paul quickly called me back and we started the interaction. And so it was all done actually remote, passing remote desktop, passing remote control, um, and sending samples by courier going through in between locations, including the development of the containers were all shipped around the world during COVID. So it was quite something where it was all done as we're doing today by Zoom. I see, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, a question here from, from Kati. She says, uh, really enjoyed seeing your, your space and where you work. Um, let me just see here. I think, oh, I lost it. There's so many. Good morning. Yeah, apologies. I can also there ask. we go. <laughs> yes, please, <Kathy. laughs> Good morning. It's really, really nice to see you and Ali present together. I think there's a lot of complementarity. So I Ali presented that he basically has everything now in house. He has engineers, he has machine learning experts, he has biological and single cell technology uh, expertise on board. I assume you have a similarly interdisciplinary team, but um, maybe it's different. So, right, you might have expertise that Ali doesn't have. And then similarly, there might be other things that are slightly different because you do use different technologies. Can you tell us a little bit more about the size and composition of your team? Yeah, so uh, the team's currently relatively small. It's two postdocs at ESRF and two postdocs at UCL. So, so. We, we have great ideas of trying to do the many different techniques that Al is doing, but we've been doing that through collaborations. And so we have done done both nanostring and we are doing spatial transcriptomics. The nanostring string was with Harvard and with Hanover. Um, and the uh, spatial transcriptomics is both with Cambridge and with the Sanger. And we, we're very, we have to really thank the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative who've just given us a grant to try and expand a bit and also really to build a grouping, as, as you said, Kathy, to pull in people who have the biological challenges because I'm not a biologist, I'm not a medic. Mm -hmm. And so um, you, the question was asked, I think it was you, Todd, who asked, asked, how do you pick to Ali, how do you pick your challenge? And what we do is as a, with a group of medics, we meet every Tuesday night via teams worldwide and sit and say, what are the really strong biological challenges? Which ones can hip CT help? And then we do the overlap of those two. We then go through, apply the techniques, figure out what other correlative techniques, because just like optical clearing, um, hip CT is just one of the many tools in the toolbox. And so then we have to go through and do the modeling, the correlative in imaging and all the other steps. So we hope to work with all of you. Yeah, yeah, we are collaborating on the fourth Kaga competition. Really exciting. Absolutely. Thanks so much for sharing data. And it's beautiful data. Um, and I hope many get to download some of this data. I had this other question. How much storage do you actually need for the 50 organs that have been scanned so far? Um, so so it's, uh, we, we figure it's about the same size as uh, the, the web says Google Earth is, about two petabytes. And, and it's growing quickly. So it's a really big question. <laughs> and so it's, not, it's, it's not all up on the web <laughs> yet. Just getting it up is not fast. Very cool. There might be other questions. Good to see you, Peter. Thanks for coming in. Yeah. And thank you very much, Kathy. Todd, uh, unfortunately, my mouse uh, batteries just died, so I can't go and read out of the chat. So okay, I have questions. a question here. This is one from <laughs> a general. <laughs> no problem. This is one from a general audience. Um, how do you keep all your students and others working on the project safe? I think this is in reference to the X-ray uh, techniques that are used. Uh, absolutely. So um, the synchrotrons are incredibly safety conscious. And so you saw um, Joseph walk through a heavy lead door. Absolutely everything is tested. All the experiments are done after those lead doors are, are shut and you're sitting comfortably in the, in the actual control room. Um, the exact same has to be done in terms of handling of the human organs as well. They're all fixed and shipped fixed, but you still have quantities of formalin and ethanol, which have to be dealt with and, and appropriate safety. So we have a very rigorous overall safety analysis and do stand, develop standard operating procedures. And then 
um, it turns out that it takes several beam times, and the beam times last three to six days, 24 hours, several of those before people can start actually running different components on their own. And then there's usually a group of two or three people in the control room running it. So we do an overall training schedule and sign off on the training. It's, it's a great question. It takes a lot of work to make sure that it stays safe. Yes. Well, great. Thank you so much uh, for taking some time out of uh, a busy time of the year to, to join us. And uh, this has been a really wonderful presentation and we hope that uh, out of this comes collaborations and um, uh, some shared shared uh, work and, and knowledge. So thank you very much. And um, I'm going to go over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep.